Hi, welcome. Uh, again, I'm Mary Margaret McAllen, uh, Director of Special Projects here at the Whitty Museum. Thank you for your participation in this very special program where we can uh, layer the knowledge of the items that we want to show at the museum, the stories we want to tell. And so the, uh, this conference on Texas has become something special, another dimension to the service that the Witte Museum would like to provide to the public. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words uh, before I introduce Hector. Uh, I've been reading the latest uh, book by Annette Gordon-Reed, and I'm so impressed with her. She's a Texan, but she writes from the perspective of a, maybe an East Coast person. And in her latest book, um, she says, I'm paraphrasing, the history of the state of Texas is the history of America. It has been described as a bellwether for what the United States was and will become. The term Texification has come to describe the process that is supposedly of recent origin. In other words, we move with the times. Texas, more than any other state in the Union, has always embodied nearly every major aspect of the story of U the United States. The confluence of people create a people, a population of caricatures of the state and its people, caricatures that, are, that they created themselves that ha helps to make the state seem exotic and almost foreign to the rest of the Union. And that, I think, is true. And it, it, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and as I like to say, when we know our history, we gain perspective, and we can calm down. So without further ado, I'm here to welcome Hector Saldana. We have some special guests with us today, the Martinez family, who have brought in these wonderful, wonderful uh, specimens, the Acosta family as well. And we were very excited to have Santiago Jimenez with us, so which is a great surprise and thrill to all of us. <laughs> this panel grew out of uh, Maurice listening to Hector Saldana on the radio um, as she was driving along. And she said, we need this man to come speak to us. And indeed, he is a wealth of knowledge uh, with the Whitliff Collection in um, San Marcos. Hector is the curator of the Texas Music Collection at the Whitliff Collection, and he's an award-winning journalist and has reported on this Texas music scene for nearly 20, uh, 30 years. Saldana is a rock musician and recording artist and the founder of the Crayolas. I'm also <laughs> running late to catch up. All right. So without further ado, it's your panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, sort of repeat the thank yous to Santiago being here, to uh, Lino and Rachel and Gloria for bringing their mothers and their families uh, guitar. I'll explain a little bit more into the Acosta family too. Uh, uh, guitars that go back uh, decades and decades and are uh, pivotal in moments of Texas music. And uh, my brother David, who's a one of the founding members of the Crayolas. And I also want to take this time to thank Mary Margaret for all the technical help from her staff and for all the encouragement. And uh, Maurice McDermott, I've known her for years. I consider her a friend, a mentor, uh, uh, inspiration. I mean, uh, we go, uh, I, was, I was the pest in the relationship <laughs> calling her uh, when a lot of this stuff was just a dream. I mean, you know, in the, in the mid 90s, it seemed like that, you know, talk of the Broadway corridor all, all these transformations that hadn't happened. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to be talking about um, Texas music, like, and especially like San Antonio and this region music, like why it sounds like, like it sounds sort of, and to sort of identify some of the themes and threads that run through it. Because, you know, Texas, Texas music is, is, um, is vast. Um, I think everyone in this room who loves music or listens to music is an expert. If you have two ears, you are an expert in music. You know what you like. If you read about music, you are an expert in music because you're ex you know, expanding your knowledge on all the ways that it happens. You know, um, 
I have to say a big thank you. You know, I work at the Whitliff Collections, but to the archivists and the researchers that make the materials available for me to discover or to present at any time. Uh, also to acknowledge out there people that are record collectors. They really are unsung heroes because a lot of times they are finding and discovering things that, you know, take a lot of listening, take a lot of discovery, especially when you're talking about 78 records or recordings that were made on literally on a wire. So there's a lot of aspects to learning about music, Texas music, and, and, uh, and, and, and how we talk about it. So obviously I can't give you the whole history of Texas music, impossible, you know, I mean, it's, it's vast, it's diverse, but I can offer some perspectives and maybe some, a couple of lenses to maybe look at it and, and how to do that. So I'm gonna be presenting some slides we can put the first one up there and some music. And so I'll be riffing a little bit, but I will be reading some too, if that's okay, because there's some things I want to not get lost because uh, I'm bubbling with enthusiasm about something. So right here, what we're looking at is much blown up from the size that it originally was. This is from 1934, and it is the earliest known graphic art depiction of Lydia Mendoza. It was printed in La Prensa. It was slightly larger than maybe three postage stamps as an advertisement. It is the advertisement for the follow-up record to Mal Hombre, which was the song that brought her to fame as a teenager. Uh, and what I find, I, I discovered this, um, doing research at the San Antonio Express News, not at the Whitliff Collections, because I was trying to find out about Celia Mireles, Lino Martinez's mom. And so she was a contemporary of Lydia. So I was going through the, you know, we think we, one thing I wanna stress is that we tend to think of music today, you know, like even when you think about old music, we think of concerts of, of how they are now. You know, we think of recordings, how they are now, how they're on the radio. But a lot of these, a lot of, in that, you know, uh, that they're somehow critiques or they might have been mentioned in, in the newspaper. In any, uh, uh, you know, any of the local newspapers in English, you would never have heard about Lydia Mendoza, ever. Rarely, not until the 1940s. In the early career, she started making records with her family in 1928. So you have to go to the uh, Spanish language sources. A lot of times those are just flyers, but uh, here locally, La Prensa. And even then, in the 1920s and the 1930s, to put that music into some historical perspective, you know, Mexican Americans, uh, and you know, we were having an, uh, like a influx of new immigrants from Mexico after the, you know, during and after the Mexican Revolution. You had a whole strata of society Hispanic society that was trying to assimilate, you know, that was forming their own social clubs, that was forming, um, you know, uh, their own sort of cultural networks. But it was very uh, stratified by um, income groups. And Lydia Mendoza was very poor, her family was very poor. And so even though we think of her as a superstar and a legend today, at that time, and even at the height of her fame, she would have been somewhat outside of the, the mainstream. I th uh, I'm gonna depend on the technical guys to play, we, uh, just maybe a snippet of Mal Ombre in case, in case someone is not familiar with that song. <laughs>
that's a teenager on the cusp of fame. And, you know, another way to think of Lydia Mendoza is, uh, to me, you know, she played a 12-string guitar, similar to the guitar on your far right. It, to me, it's very, you know, when you listen to that sort of heartbreak and heartache and haunting voice and that 12-string guitar, which is the way that she always accompanied herself, from my vantage, it's a lot closer to the blues, you know, the, think, the way that we might think of Mance Lipscomb or Lead Belly. It really is, you know, and that, and that record is made in 1934, and, you know, again, think of it in, in context. This was not the most, this was not extremely popular Mexican music with the Mexican-American masses, because at that time, you know, we're in full-blown film, radio, and like I said, there's, there's romantic music out of Mexico. There's, there is even a mainstream sort of sound. She was m more an artist that you would have heard perhaps on the radio, but mostly she did not play really concerts. I mean, it was much closer to playing on the side of the road, playing for uh, cotton pickers, a, occasionally in a church, sometimes in a, a plaza. Uh, can we have the next panel, just so you can see what she looked like in real life? This is about, you know, now, what's that, 16 years later, here backstage at the National Theater. But um, it was a hard life. I want to read a little bit out of Yolanda Broyles Gonzalez's book, just to give you uh, a little bit of perspective from Lydia's voice, the way San Antonio was in the 1920s and 30s. Quote, the poor people who worked would go into town on Saturday just to pass the time. They would just walk the streets to buy an ice cream, anything. Because to make matters worse, and we're talking about in the Depression era, there was so much discrimination against Mexicans. Mexicans could not enter restaurants. If there was a restaurant, they could not eat there. If they were Mexicans, they were not allowed. If it wasn't a Mexican place, they could not enter the place. So we would arrive and create a fanfare with our music. We would sit there on a corner and we would stay there. They'd let us use some benches or whatever. That's where we'd start to sing. People would gather around us and give us whatever they wanted to give. We didn't charge, you see but we did make good money, especially during the picking season. They talk about when cotton was good, people had money. But that was our existence, earning and struggling in life. Uh, that's from the book by Yolanda Broyles Gonzalez called Lydia Mendoza's Life in Music. Um, I read that because, again, you know, we have such high, we hold her in such high esteem in these days, you know? But again, the kind of programs that they were doing um, were, <laughs> were difficult to say the least, especially like when highways weren't even paved. Like for example, um, one of her earliest memories was for her father was often running out of gas on the drive to other cities because uh, generally speaking during the depression, even when you could make money somewhere, you had to move on because people did not have money. This was true for Bob Wills as well. You know, these dances that Bob Wills was famous for, they did not happen in the same place. People barely had any money. For example, here's an example of the poverty. This is from Lydia Mendoza's mouth when they made some money. They would collect 25 cents to 35 cents a night. A nickel would buy a bottle of milk. Another nickel got you lard. Another nickel was for masa. Rent was about $5 a month. So I, I say that because I think it might add to the enjoyment of listening to the music. And even if it doesn't, it's something that I think if, as music lovers, we should understand how that music happened. And maybe it will add, you know, impart a little bit more meaning to it, possibly. Now, uh, you know, I have about 
20 panels. We may not get through it. That's okay. Texas music is meant to enjoy. I, I hope this is fun and interesting, but we'll talk about stuff that uh, matters musically. I think one of the things that's interesting, as we heard with Lydia sing Malombre, that was a song that as a young girl, nine years old, she had seen those, those lyrics. There used to be words in bubblegum wrappers. So she knew the words to this song, but she had never heard it. She was born in Houston, Texas. The family traveled a lot uh, with uh, crops. They were very, very poor. They came to San Antonio to record in 1928 as a uh, quartet, the Carta Blanca Quartet, translated to English. It was called that because her father enjoyed Carta Blanca beer. And they made recordings. She played mandolin back then. But often the family to make money would travel into Mexico, live there for a while, come back. And I, you know, deep in, in the Saldana family past, you know, my grandmother and grand, great grandparents, people that were born in the United States would go back to Mexico to work and then they'd come back again. It was, it was, it, it's, it's hard to imagine today, right? With <laughs> the conditions that uh, the politi politics being as they are today, but that's how they lived. And it wasn't until one of those trips when she was a, a young girl still, that her, her father was a, a big fan of, of theater and loved to go see opera and see uh, vaudeville, you know, the Mexican version of vaudeville. And that's in, in a Mexico uh, theater, that's where she heard the song Mal Hombre for the first time. It was sung, all we know is that it was sung by a young woman. And to this day, the true composer of that song is unknown. So Lydia, in her books, in the, in the book by Broyles, said that she only heard that song one time, and it wasn't until years later that she actually recorded it, but she always held on to that, that uh, melody, and she always, uh, uh, and she married it to those words, and that's the record that we uh, remember. You know, in that poster, and we don't have to, uh, well, maybe, can we go backwards on that? Just one, just because I need, I need to read it. But this was, an, you know, like I said, a very small advertising uh, for her second record. And it says, you know, Artista Exclusiva and Pajaro Azul. She was on the Bluebird la label. That was a label, a record label that RCA had uh, that was designated for uh, like country artists, like hillbilly music, some blues and some Mexican artists. It was not, it was like a, a subsidiary. It wasn't their top label, but it was recordings. But you know, one thing that we, th when we do think of Lydia Mendoza and one thing that makes me you know, really admire her that, you know, there weren't a lot of women doing this or hardly any, and there weren't a lot of people doing this. You know, in her books, you know, when she talks about her travel, she says there weren't, it wasn't like t today where you have a lot of musicians touring all over the place. It was pretty lonely. But her second record, you know, and they forget the Enya on the end, but Mundo Engañoso, you know, it's, it's like uh, uh, deceitful world, you know, and sigue adelante, you know, move on or let's go forward, you know, very much in keeping with sort of that image that she projected, you know, even at a young age, here we, we have this, and she was always a solitary performer. She was not one of these people that was backed up by mariachi. She was not backed up by orchestras. She always performed, like I said, almost like a Bob Dylan type character with a 12 string guitar singing her music. So the solitary Lydia Mendoza with her name misspelled on that poster, uh, that's the first look. And it's, it's kind of funny. It's a very idealized sort of depiction of a young woman and holding a guitar. And almost, we almost get that Virgen de Guadalupe look around her, her head, right? I mean, it's almost, you know, we're almost getting that. So let's move on to a couple of panels, I guess. Now, it gets even, it gets even gooder, as they say. It gets good. Uh, when I was a reporter at the San Antonio Express News, you know, we uh, when you work at a newspaper, you tend to go to lunch together, come back. You know, we'd haul somewhere downtown and walk back. So I'd walked in, and the security guard goes, "There's a man that wants to talk to you." And I said, "Oh, okay." And so he was there waiting for me with a guitar case and a photograph. He had this photograph, and he said, "This is my mother, Celia Mireles. I don't know a whole lot about her. I know something, but she made records." at the same time as Lydia Mendoza. I had never heard of her, this sort of forgotten ranchera singer, a contemporary of uh, Lydia Mendoza. But you know, when he uh, opened the guitar case 
and he had, like I said, the guitar on the far right, which is, uh, you know, uh, it's an Acosta guitar made by the uh, great-grandfather. Is that right, Jimmy? Made by Guadalupe was your great-grandfather? Yes. Made in the late, either the late 1920s or early 30s for the recordings. And um, I, was, I was blown away. I said, wow, you know, uh, you know, so a lot of times, you know, we always heard, well, Lydia was the first or she's the only, but now, you know, she recorded on Bluebird. Well, I came to learn that Celia Mireles recorded on Vocalion, the only other label that existed. And um, it, was, it, was, it was wild to me. And then there was some mystery to it. You know, there's the, the name Manuel Mendoza carved into the guitar. And at that time, we had no clue. And I went around to, you know, Flaco Jimenez. I went around to Flaco Jimenez. I don't know who that is. And I went around to Mike Acosta, whose uh, grandfather had built the guitar. He was like, I don't know. And then I went to Rita Vidarre, who was a contemporary of, of, of these people as well. And she goes, oh, yeah, that's Lydia's brother. He used to drive a bus. You know, I was like, whoa. <laughs> you know, I was like crazy. Like, I mean, so, because, you know, we know that there was a, a, a through the stories that, your mother would tell that there was a family connection to Lydia Mendoza, but it was still like, well, what was it? You know, we're still not clear what that relationship was, but obviously we know that Manuel had some connection to this guitar. And then just today we were, I was taking some little measurements of the guitar. I said, I just want to know how big that guitar is. And we were looking at the back and there's another name in the, it's not even carved in there. It's more indented in the back of the gu guitar. Eva Munoz. So now I'm on another trail to find out who is Eva Munoz. I hope I hope she's another uh, singer or songwriter. But it just it sort of is just a reminder that sometimes these stories aren't all set in stone, you know. And that's why I'm kind of going over the maybe the, it's good to understand the the context of the times that the music was made, how they were living, and also to think of like today. You know, a lot of things don't happen in a vacuum. So, I mean, to me, it made perfect sense that there might be s someone making music. I'm sure there were a lot of uh, women. Now, were the obstacles much greater for women at the time? Yes, obviously. I mean, it was just not, I mean, Lydia Mendoza goes into it in her book. I mean, it was not, she was looked down upon, you know, not only because she was a woman in a man's world, but because she was playing peasant music, you know, or cantina music, even though she did not play cantinas. And so I started on the journey of Celia Mireles. And I, I believe we do have an audio clip. We can hear a little bit. Uh, either one will work. Perhaps. Or maybe I have it. Oh, maybe you have it. In a... I was wrong to make no, not that one. <laughs> wow, she got, we updated her sound. No, that's great. Oh, yeah. Pipito Pel, Sonia China, por qué me mira a su lado? She's wondering why a man is giving her these sideways looks and not just coming out and saying why he likes her. So you can hear there's some similarities. We hear the 12 string. We hear we can tell she's pretty good on that guitar. I, I, what I hear is a little, almost some outside influence where maybe Lydia's voice has a, maybe a little bit more crying quality. This one is a little more, I would say, raw, rustic. But you know, uh, in doing the research, you know they they played similar places, and there is actually evidence that she was playing the 12 string guitar before Lydia Mendoza, and that Lydia Mendoza may have gotten a, a 12 string because Celia Mireles was, was playing one. Um, I include her because she is sort of a forgotten figure from history, and I'm sure there's others 
uh, from that era. And also, you know, we, we tend to think of recording artists or uh, only like one way, they must have been doing shows or, they, or only radio. Um, but in that era, to make money, um, they also tried their hand at vaudeville. And for example, I had never really thought of Lydia Mendoza this way, but going into the uh, materials a little bit more deeply, uh, you know, in other words, you wonder, well, was this young woman just wandering the earth with that 12-string guitar, or what was happening? But she had a, an act of, uh, you know, as a child, she'd been part of this quartet with her parents, sort of like the, Car the way we think of the Carter family, you know, the way the Carter family traveled to make a recording, so did the Mendoza family, came to San Antonio to make the earliest recordings in 1928. But in that 1930s period, again, Depression era period, this will give you a little bit of example uh, from her mouth describing what was going on. So the act was 90 minutes long, and how it would happen was first there was the movie, then the act followed. Her brother Manuel and sister Juanita would do a comedy sketch. Then her sister Maria would sing and play piano. Her siblings would change into dancing outfits and Maria would accompany them. The siblings would perform mildly, and I mean very mildly risque songs. Then the siblings as a trio would perform and then Lydia would perform alone. And then her mother, Leonor, would get on stage and she was sort of the, the driving force. So again, sort of like what we ha see in uh, the American story, right? Of usually there's a stage mom or stage dad involved, you know, that's we, echoes of Selena there, right? And uh, doing what you had to do to make it. Let's, let's move to the next panel, please. So these were uh, just, uh, I include them just to let you know this, just to uh, uh, provide a photo from the early 1940s of these young girls, sisters that em were emulating uh, sort of the style of Lydia Mendoza and performing in the uh, plaza, uh, the plaza de Sacate, the, the plaza of grass uh, downtown. Uh, let me, we'll leave that picture there for just a second, and I'm going to just do the last of the reading here from, this is a direct quote from Lydia Mendoza about those days, about what it would have been like in San Antonio. You know, I guess, you know, sometimes we think, oh, the chili queens, but it was really uh, music and, and uh, well, here's Lydia, how she described it. In those days, the marketplace in San Antonio was so Mexican. In those days, you felt like you were in Mexico. So beautiful. You can't imagine the joy you felt at that Plaza de Zacate, the grass plaza, which is now called El Mercado. At that time, it was completely outdoors, and that musical ambiance at night, you, just, you can't imagine the happiness pe people felt. There were trios playing and singing everywhere. She described those as very, very Mexican times. Um, it's kind of fun to think of San Antonio. I mean, you know, in many ways, it sta San Antonio stays the same. It kind of changes, but that was that era. I guess uh, next panel, please. So Bob Wills, you, the king of Western swing, great, you know, one of the gr true greats of Texas music. Yeah, you know, but there's lots of true greats when it comes to Western music. But Bob Wills was a, a king. You know, let's let's hear a little bit of Bob Wills here. This this is him pictured in 1937, uh, right as he's becoming famous, really. You know, first, these are, this recording you're gonna hear is from the Tiffany transcriptions, some of his most famous recordings from 1946. Thinking of the weeks to come. Ah, that's what I was thinking. Old cotton patch is hot. Can't think of a worse spot to be on a hot summer day. Oh, boy. Go on. Next week I will get my hoe down uh -huh. 
and I'll hit the field at break of day. Don't go down there without your file, you know. That will be so sad. My feet will hurt so bad when I chop the cotton all the day. Oh. So you can hear echoes of, or you know, where Doug Somm may have gotten his inspiration and where a lot of us, you know, uh, have heard about that fiddle, that famous fiddle. So for this, and I'll keep this brief, you know, because again, when you talk about Texas music, you can, you can just focus on one aspect or lots of it. And you know, you, you, it's impossible to include everybody unless you're Michael Corcoran or <laughs> Joe Nick Potowski or one of these writers that you have to go deep, deep to, you know, there's just so much story there. So I just want to just emphasize, I'm just giving a little poquito de todo, a taste of it, offering maybe a little bit different lens, you know? Because often when we talk about Texas music or when we talk about music like Lydia Mendoza, we do not really take into consideration, we're talking about American music. We're talking about music made by someone born in the United States, in the United States, it, you know, even though it sounds very Spanish or Mexican to us, it is American music, just as American as Bob Wills or Willie Nelson's. So I went back, I wanted, you know, so much has been said about Bob Wills, but in our collections we do have a book that's not all that hard to find. We have a first edition book from 1938, so really pre-fame, you know, really just on the cusp of where he's being famous by a woman named Ruth Sheldon. The book is called Hub in It. It's really fascinating because it's mostly, you can, she was a reporter for the Tulsa Tribune and her editor asked her to find out about this guy, who, this fiddle player, who was getting a thousand fan letters a week. So she was very interested, but it, she makes it clear in the intro to her book that it's that the info, the information, you know, comes from Wills. You know, it does. It's it's sort of as told to. So it's interesting at that at that point of his career, you know, not the beginning of the legend, I guess. So let me just add a few things from the book that I thought were interesting. I said she described a man in glowing terms, one with a common touch, much like Will Rogers and Abraham Lincoln. I mean, she used those descriptions of the guy. You can almost imagine his character. She describes him, she says, he was a character who had picked cotton, been a hobo, a preacher, a carpenter, roughneck surveyor, shoe shiner, car salesman, barber, and medicine show entertainer. And in the book, we learn that medicine show entertainer is a euphemism for blackface performer at also. You know, we don't, you know, even Jimmy Rogers, I think in that Ken Burns documentary comes out that they're, they performed in blackface. There was a reason for that because again, in the depression, you could make a lot of money in a medicine show traveling around. You had sponsors for that. She described, but to me, this part was very vivid also about the times of when she met Bob Wills and what was still going on in Texas in the 1930s, as far as his audience, and as far as like what, what the attitude was. And I, I was, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but it's kind of shocking too to think about life in Texas at that time. She goes, the world of Bob Wills was one where empty bellies, twisted minds, oppressed souls, Enslaved bodies make the nightmares of sleep indistinguishable from the nightmares of wakeful living. You know, we think about those photos of bread lines or soup lines and Dust Bowl era photos. It's pretty graphic to hear it like that, you know. And in the book, Bob Wills was often hungry. He was born in a lightning storm a little before midnight on March 6, 1906. His father, uncle's grandfather were fiddlers. The Wills and Foley families were musical families. They were also often impoverished cotton farmers. And so, uh, you know, his early life was spent uh, often in severe poverty. Uh, his father wanted him to be a fiddler and it's kind of hard to think of Bob Wills as being ambivalent about music, but as a young man, he was ambivalent about music. He, was, he did not 
he had a natural talent and he taught himself guitar and fiddle by ear, almost like automatically. It's really kind of amazing, but he acknowledged that it really, it was not his first thing he wanted to do. I mean, he really at one point thought he wanted to be a preacher. This is a teenager. And uh, he, he, uh, he spoke a lot often about being very, very hungry. And, uh, you know, and when they first got those ideas about uh, doing, uh, you know, dances to make money, you know, like in other words, he was an innovator uh, that he was one of the first, at least in Texas, and especially, you know, to, be, to get as successful as he was, to take what little earnings he had, you know, and take the chance and rent a small place and hold the dance and, and uh, you know, charge a few pennies or whatever, you know, 50 cents for the, for the dance and walk away with money. And, but the thing was, in the book is very clear, you couldn't, you know, that was not like, oh, I've got a great idea, that's my gig in town. People didn't have money. And he said, like, when the cotton uh, crops or the prices dropped out of it, he goes, they had no money. So, you know, you were often uh, just stuck. So that's why, that's really what got them touring. They had to go to other cities just to make, you know, just to eke out a living. And then that's often where they found the musicians, you know, like people that wanted to, you know, adventure. You know, it was a time of adventure when we think of, uh, of that era. You know, uh, you know, again, you have to kind of think of Texas as one uh, that's uh, sort of depression era Texas. So we're talking about post Mexican Revolution. You know, that's still like right in the forefront of memory. Post World War One. You know, that's still on people's minds, their attitudes, and on the cusp of World War Two. You know, that's that's the era that Texas music. The way it sounds today, that's where it was born. I mean, we can go back to the logging camps of East Texas uh, at the very end of the 19th century, which is where, you know, Boogie Woogie is kind of born, and, you know, you can make an argument, and some people do that jazz kind of, you know, uh, came out of those logging camps. But really, the music that we think of as Texas music, you know, whether more Latin or more country or even rock and roll, those roots, that's those deep influences of those pioneers, they come out, out of a, a tough, tough time. I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, and then to think of this young guy, too, riding the rails. I mean, he just left home and started riding the rails, and he did odd jobs, and he'd run out of money and have no money, and he'd, you know, play the fiddle on a, on a, on a, at a uh, train depot and make a couple of bucks to move to the next town. Uh, and then he became a preacher, and he moved on. Let's let's move to the uh, to another slide. But Bob Wills is is great. His story is incredible. I include Cindy Walker here because she's of that same era. Uh, she's a we have her archives at the uh, Whitliff Collections. Uh, she's an ama amazing singer uh, and songwriter. She was known for her songwriting. And uh, can we go to the next panel as well, please? So. As a, also, as a teenager, she wanted to be a songwriter. They went out to California, you know, and again, to put things in context, even Lydia Mendoza talks about it. They're being influenced by movies by Roy Rogers, you know, the gangsters, you know, all those, you know, Bonnie and Clyde are in the headlines. I mean, these, this was the world, this was their world, you know, this was what was uh, inspiring them. But she got her first song sold, Bing Crosby recorded it. Let's hear a little of that one. sitting alone in the twilight watching the sky grow pale in my heart there is a rankling to be ganklin on old Pinto down Can hear the so th that's her start. Again, a teenager, a, woman, a young woman from the head of Texas. Big dreams. Again, trying to make it in a man's world. Play the next audio clip. This is the song that, I mean, she's one of, the, I think she's probably one of Texas.
course, great women performers and writers and inspirations. Uh, Cindy Walker, huge inspiration on Willie Nelson, huge inspiration and friend of Willie Nelson's and uh, Doug Somm and so many people. Uh, next slide, please. I just include this too. Uh, Willie Nelson was a big admirer of, of uh, Cindy Walker. This is the, the cover page. It was included in the Ken Burns documentary. We have the book at the Whitliffe Collections. This is his songbook from when he was 10 years old. And uh, you can just see he wrote Waco, Texas, like a rope, I would say. It looks kind of like a rope. It looks, to me, it looks like the end of the songs is a, a little horse. And uh, maybe that's a star over the Willie. I don't know. I can't tell. But... I, th I don't think, when you look at that, there's no doubt that that kid, Willie Nelson, and as you go into the songbook, I mean, he talks, there's songs, you know, this 10-year-old's writing drinking songs, songs about love, heartache, faded love. It's great. So anyway, I just had to include that because uh, of Cindy Walker. Big influence on Willie. Next panel, please. Okay. Now we're bringing it here to San Antonio. We're jumping forward quite a bit. And I, I did not include the photo of the person I'm going to talk about right now, but we're getting to, we're getting to the heart of the matter right now. Obviously, Flaco Jimenez, this is Santiago Jimenez's brother. Uh, let's go to the next panel as well. There's, there's uh, the young Santiago and Flaco, 1961 on the left at Woodlawn Lake. One of the great joys of my life was finding out, and it was a huge buzz that the brothers were for the first time in 30 years, going to be performing together on stage at the Tejano Conjunto Festival. Very exciting. They are, they are close. They love each other very much. The relationship is complicated because their paths are different. You know, Flaco Jimenez is known for uh, as an ambassador of Conjunto, but really he's uh, known for being able to fit into rock and roll, into country. Santiago Jimenez Jr. right here is the living embodiment of his father, Don Santiago, who was the songwriter of the family. A, a songwriter and a pioneer of Conjunto music, one of the true inventors of the genre. It's incredible, but I wanted to recreate the scene at uh, Woodlawn Lake, and we got them as as close to, as the brothers could remember where they stood. And so uh, that's a very happy day for me to see that photo recreated. It was just so much fun. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and then I will read a little bit here. And we'll get into some fighting words about conjunto music. So that's Santiago Jimenez on the left. The, the father, the, one of the uh, fathers of conjunto. I say one of the fathers because it's not argued. He is one of the inventors of the genre. He made some recordings in the late 20s where he played guitar. He was not on accordion yet as a duo. But it is really his recordings in the 1930s along with a man named Narciso Martinez in the Valley who invent conjunto music, at least in Texas. And again, music doesn't happen in a vacuum. And... Uh, there's lots of people innovating at the same time. And um, I will just explain that conjunto music in its simplest terms means that you use an instrument <clears throat> not with two necks, but with one neck, a bajo sexto, which is, has 12 strings, but it's not a 12-string guitar. It's closer to a bass. It adds that sort of explosive punch to conjunto. And then the accordion. It's a two-piece accompaniment. There's different variations on that, but I think... You get, you know, and, and sometimes there's arguments about, well, someone was the first to add the bass to the conjunto and someone brought in the saxophone. But I think it's to lose the point. Really, the point about conjunto music is that the songs, the lyrics, and even the melodies reflect the times that the composers were living in and reflecting life around them. Not only in the lyrics, when there were lyrics, but in the titles. And I'll give some examples. So I, I, it was... I'm remiss by not including the photo of this next gentleman that I'm going to talk to, but I want to set it up a little bit before having bringing Santiago to, do, to demonstrate something for me. So, as I said, I mentioned the name Narciso Martinez, another giant, right? A giant when you talk about conjunto, about inventing it, inventing a genre, you know, an American genre, just like jazz, born in the United States. Um, let me read a little bit, if it's okay, rather than riff on something. 
So to fully appreciate the historic significance of, an, and I'm talking about a song that he wrote that is in the Smithsonian. It's part of the National Registry. It is, that's why I say fighting words. Some consider it the most important first Conjunto song. There's arguments about that because of the timing of it from 1936. The song is called La Chicharronera, the pork skin lady, okay? Let me read a little bit. Okay, it might make it a little more clear. To fully appreciate the historic significance of a nearly 90-year-old conjunto polka recording, considered to be a building block of Tejano music, again, one must try to reimagine or imagine Depression-era Texas. So we're talking about post-Mexican Revolution, post-World War I, and World War II right around the corner. Texas is segregated, rural, we forget how rural Texas was, and agricultural in the mid-1930s. There are stark class differences. Many Mexicans and Mexican-Americans are poor, often residing in colonias, shanty towns on the edges of cities, and often because of the Mexican, uh, you know, because of uh, uh, skirmishes on the border, uh, Latinos are looked upon it as suspicious with suspicion, especially when we got into World War uh, I and there were fears of German spies in Mexico. It was a very, it was a very uh, heady time, very, very worrisome time. But the song La Chicharronera, The Pork Skin Lady, by button accordionist Narciso Martinez, accompanied, accompanied by bajo sexto musician Santiago Almeida of the lower Rio, Van Rio Grande Valley, was born in that long ago age. It's a seminal recording from 1936. It was a hit, uh, one of the earliest known conjunto rec records with that accordion and bajo sexto instrumentation. Am I, is that fair to say, Santiago? Yes. yes. And it is a pivotal moment in the history of, of Tejano music because Tejano music is birthed, you know, eventually out of the romantic music of Mexico, but of the conjunto music that you know, takes so many turns before it reaches someone like Selena. So it, it, it did mark the emergence of a new and original sort of musical ensemble and style. So 1936, to put it a little perspective, that same year, that's the Texas centennial. We were marking 100 years of independence from Mexico. Uh, but, you know, in that time, you know, we're celebrating independence from Mexico, but Texas is seeing like an explosion of population of Mexican immigrants. Uh, it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see that just even the demographics besides the music. So, um, you know, with, uh, you know, the conjunto music was something a little bit different. It was very rural. It was music of la raza, the people. Uh, it was music of migrant workers and the poor. Very humble uh, instrumentation. Let, let's play a little of the music. It, it's it's uh, La Chicha Ronera, that audio from Spotify. The, the Narciso Martinez track. <laughs> Believe it or not, at one time that was considered brand new, stark, wild, you know, but that music doesn't happen unless uh, Narciso and your dad are listening to German music, to Polish music, to Czech music, those enclaves in Texas that were very influential on that sound. That's where this comes from. Sped up slightly. Narciso was known for a slightly faster style. Uh, Santiago's dad was known for a little, maybe more soulful, I might say, a little rootsier kind of style. But La Chicharronera, you know, there's no words. That's a, you, we can fade that out. But it's, again, it's reflecting that life around them, you know. Uh, it's it's uh, released on Bluebird Records. Again, the, the label that was really set, set aside for African-American musicians or the most rural of the country music. You know, the most, I guess we would say, hillbilly music or that most, you know, high lonesome type music was there. Uh, but again, we talk about fighting words. That same year, you do have Santiago Jimenez, who was, no, who was the original Flaco. A lot of people don't know that his father was El Flaco. That's what it said on those 78s. He was the original. And a song called Dices Pescal on the DECA label was that same year. And uh, 
innovative in that it included bass guitar. Let's play just a little bit of that too. So similar, but we hear that German influence. We can fade that out. Um, so again, music made very, you know, it, it is sort of humble music. It's happy music. It's instrumental music. But that title is sort of a slang title. It's an inside joke. And then La Chicha Roneta about this porkskin lady. You know, I mean, uh, very, very interesting. Again, they're, they're talking about their life. You know, it may not have been Bob Will's life at that time or the big band era life, but it's talking about their life. And also, they're talking about them, themselves in a certain way. Those labels are very interesting. Uh, Narciso Martinez was known as El Huracán del Valle, the hurricane of the valley. And Flaco, you know, Santiago Jimenez was known as El Flaco. And so they were, they were musical rivals in a sense, even though uh, uh, transmission of, of information was not like today, you know. But they were rivals, and those nicknames and or those names, those personas, they're just as important as a boxers or a gangsters, I would say, you know, because these aren't names that are, you know, think about it. They're that's pretty, that's pretty out there. That's kind of bold, right? To say I'm the hurricane of the accordion, or I'm the, the this or that. But it's you know, and also, but I think the more fascinating part is that these aren't names that are, are hoisted on them by record companies. You know, they're sort of proclamations, you know. And when you think of the music that way, it's not quite so humble, you know. It's like all music, sheer expression. And we're talking about some of the very poorest people around making that music. Um, play, uh, let's see, do me, uh, before I bring Santiago up, uh, I want to explain something that when I said that uh, Santiago Jimenez, the father, was the, the I, I, what I consider the true song, I mean, you're all our songwriters, but I mean, the songwriter. And I'm talking about Bob Dylan level songwriter, okay? He uh, had a photographic memory. He never learned to read or write, only his name. He composed very complicated melodies and songs with lyrics which he would remember. Uh, Flaco would sometimes tell, give him an idea for a song, and the dad would say, let me, let me write it. Um, if we could play just a little bit of uh, Un Mojado Sin Licencia. That talks about if you were Mexican-American at the time or, or, or a new immigrant that I'm, and new in this country, you needed a license to do anything. You know, you needed to have credentials to do work, even to work at a construction site, or to, be, you know, don't dare get caught by driving a car without it. Play a little bit. <laughs> Se me hizo fácil comprar un carro para sacar a pasear a mi crecencia. Y por la noche fui a dar al bote. We can fade that out a little bit. So, you know, so, you know, there's, uh, that's a sense of humor in that song, obviously, right? And, uh, but he could, you know, come up with all that just, you know, himself. Uh, and before I let Santiago Jimenez Jr. hijack and to elevate this program to the highest level here in just a moment, I've got to get this in because I have, I do, you know, I consider Santiago a dear friend and Flaco Jimenez too. And they're both uh, highly in, in, in intelligent musicians, natural musicians. I've, I just really have never quite understood how they translate that music from the brain to the fingers, you know? And, but also, just like Maurice McDermott, I always appreciate very honest and direct 
uh, explanations and answers to that stuff because that's how we really do move forward, you know. And uh, and Flacco and Santiago both always speak from the heart. And um, before I turn it over to Santiago, I want to just sort of convey an image from Flacco. So Flacco was about they had when you, when you get to know the the sons, you understand that they had incredible respect for the father. I mean, it, I mean like. Most of us or all of us, but they very much respected him. A, a man that had to work night and day to try to make a living for his family. They were very, very poor. Flacco remembers the kitchen with dirt floor and outside toilets and uh, his father working at the quarry and coming home and then going and playing to try to, you know, make a little bit extra money. But much like... Uh, Esteban Jordan, Steve Jordan, at a young, young age, these guys are intrigued by that squeeze box, but did dare not touch it in their dad's presence. But Flaco Jimenez was six years old when he got the courage to play his father's accordion. This is Flaco saying, quote, he had just one accordion and I started learning it without him knowing while he was at work. But one day, Flacco's dad came home early. And usually, Flacco said that he could hear his dad's car. He didn't this day because his dad drove an old jalopy, a Model A. Again, a reminder of sort of the uh, setting where this music com comes from, you know, how it is, how we, how it's, uh, how I, I get more enjoyment thinking of those times and the music, how it's made. You know, I don't know. I just think, well, how did they make such great sounding music and live the way they did sometimes? But... He arrived early and did not make his presence known. He stood by the door and he listened to his son, Flacco, who was not Flacco, he was Leonardo, little Leonardo, playing one of the polkas that the father had composed. This is Flacco talking, quote, he stood there for I don't know how long. He opened the door and came straight to me, crying. He gave me a big hug. Quote, he was real surprised to hear someone playing his songs. I had never seen him cry before. He cried because he was happy. Now Flacco, being, Flacco has to continue the story going, he caught me red-handed. <laughs> but he was real proud. The tears were like a waterfall but he gave me the green light. And eventually, El Flacco did turn over, turn over the mantle to Flacco, at least as far as the nickname. Now, the man I'm gonna introduce to you here, Santiago Jimenez Jr., needs no introduction, really. I've asked him to be here, and he's, uh, he's been generous no enough to be here, just like Lino and his sister and his wife and Jimmy and Sylvia uh, Acosta. Uh, to help sort of illustrate the music. And uh, if you don't know, first of all, Santiago Jimenez Jr. is a National Endowment of the Arts National Heritage Award recipient, the highest honor a folk musician can achieve in this country. It's incredible. Uh, he's made incredible recordings. He carries on the stylings, I would say, or, or, or he was very close to his father growing up. They worked together. He plays a two-row, is that correct? And, uh, and Santiago, Don Santiago, played a two-row accordion. Flaco Jimenez plays a, a button. They're all button accordions, but with three rows of buttons. It's a slightly different instrument, a little, maybe a little earthier, maybe a little gritty. But either way, it, it, it's a certain sound. We have couple of minutes. Can I let him up? But I want him to demonstrate and talk a little bit and, uh, about a song called Piedras Negras, the flood of Piedras Negras. In 1954, Piedras Negras was almost wiped off the face of the earth. And I'm going to let Santiago explain what that moment was like. Um, we may go a little over. Is that okay? We go five minutes over. Is that okay? Um, because his, they were m literally mopping a floor working as custodians when the news on the radio broke, and he will demonstrate that tune. Please. 
Santiago Jimenez Jr. Well, uh, first of all, uh, you, you are going to have to bear with me because uh, it takes about a week to finish all my conversation <laughs> about my father. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to be as more specific. Uh, I'm a little shaking, you know, I don't know why. I mean, I have done this for many years. But uh, it's normal. You understand it, right? Okay. Uh, I used to work with my dad in the, at the Good Samaritan Center over there at the west side. Uh, we were custodian. My father was my supervisor. He was my boss. So I had to do what he said, right? Okay. At the time in 1954, when uh, Piedras Negras was getting flooded, you know, after the storm here in San Antonio, Tamien, you know, well, uh, my father used to have a, a radio. At, uh, once everybody would leave uh, home, you know, after work, uh, we would work at night uh, on the afternoon at 5 o'clock sweeping the floors, mopping the floors, and at the same time, but my father used to always have a radio with a tube radio, you know, not not the new ones, you know, the old school radio. And he would turn on the radio and he would hear the news about what was going in Piedras Negras. Uh, my father didn't know how to read or write. Everything that he would compose was like a computer. His brain was like a computer. He would fix 156 songs, no, not knowing how to write. Anyway, so uh, I remember that he was mopping the floor and he was mumbling, you know, mopping the floor. And at the same time, he was hearing the, the news. And he was mumbling. And I'm going to just follow him up on him. So I got it. I said, what? I already composed a song for Piedras Negras. Wow. In 1954, he recorded it. That same year that we having, they were having that tragedy over there, you know? Anyway, so he recorded it, and then uh, I recorded it, too, because uh, I'm going to, do you mind if I sing it for you all? Or yeah. How much? Okay. Can, can, okay. I, can I just add one thing too? Yeah. That, uh, you know, this is a beautiful song. His, Help me, his, please. His, no, no. Help his me. father wrote lots of beautiful songs, but that this song I consider to be at the same level, not below or above, the Lonesome Ballad of Hattie Carroll by Bob Dylan, because it, it describes a tragedy in the most poetic terms. It was done instantly, and it's just incredible to, to think that. You know, one part that Santiago left out was that when his said, dad said, got it, he saw the mijo go get the accordion, right? Because it's not like he had an accordion around. Right. And exactly. he composed it. Yeah. So this is the way it sounded in that instance, right? Right. Okay. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Este desastre pasó, quedó el pueblo destrozado, también mucha gente ahogada murió. El año 54, tres de la tarde serían. Abandonando a sus casas, todita la gente, las lomas corrían. Toda la gente gritaba, piden rocío y corrían. 
Y en el agua del río Bravo, a cada momento subía y subía. Los ratios de San Antonio cada momento anunciaban que en pueblo de piedras negras los niños chiquitos de hambre lloraban. ¡Ay, qué terrible, señores! Daba mucha compasión de ver los niños chiquitos, hombres y mujeres, llorar de dolor. Ya con esta me despido, con dolor del corazón, que en pueblo de piedras negras quedó destrozado por la inundación. Santiago Jiménez, Junior.